All right. This intro was created by Aaron Mulatto. If anyone wants to try to beat it, I'll give you extra credit. So I guess that after that we're ready to go to the notes. Thank you anyway, Aaron. That was awesome. <laughs> I love it. Alright. Let's get you in there. There we are. Alright. Alright, after that wonderful introduction, um, this is too close. You don't want to see me that close. That's better. This is block seven, notes number two, go west, young man. Western expansion is, in a way, the story of the United States uh, for the first almost, what, 1600, 1700, 1800, 19, the first 300 years of its existence, that the explorers headed west from Europe, the pilgrims headed west across the ocean, and then uh, pioneers headed west uh, into the Appalachians, and then west over the Appalachians, and west into the Ohio River Valley, and west to the Mississippi, and then west to the Pacific Ocean. That, until the 1890s, when the frontier was finally closed, the history of the United States of America was truly a westward expansion. And like the notes say, Americans had been slowly moving westward from the Pilgrims. Um, and it was culturally seen as something that was very difficult. Let's see which one of these moves it. Forget it. We'll do it next time. Expansion was seen as something that was difficult and that required, not, not impossible, but difficult, something that required patience and hard work and a little bit of luck and hardship. That Pioneering was not for the faint of heart. That if you were kind of like, oh, I don't know if I want to go or not, don't go. That the first settlers were, you know, not ordinary people. They were a little bit tougher than that. John Adams, in one of his quotes, kind of neatly summed up the idea of American expansion uh, early on. And he said, quote, that wild animals and wild men, mighty forests... Uh, and mighty something else that I forgot to type in your notes, beset the path. The West will be conquered from the trees and the rocks and the wild beasts. This is not something for the faint of heart. And as we saw in American history, that settlers had pushed way west, away from the uh, Atlantic coast to the Appalachians, and then over into the Mississippi River Valley. By the 1840s, Americans had been doing this for a long enough time, I guess, that the cultural idea behind expansion, the idea that this was somehow not for ordinary people, started to change. And the attitude of the West became an attitude not of something that had to be conquered, but something that was just ripe for the taking. Something that would be picked, like a big ripe apple is picked from a low-hanging branch. That and this idea started to spread, and Americans started to believe that this whole continent, from sea to shining sea, was to be conquered for the American experiment, conquered for democracy, conquered for economic freedom. That from the Atlantic to the Pacific, the entire continent was to be American. And that the country would stretch from Maine to California. And that idea that this whole continent was American by birthright got a name. And that name is, letter C, Manifest Destiny. It was a New York journalist by the name of John O'Sullivan who coined the phrase and he captured the zeitgeist, which is a good word, the spirit of the age, the overall feeling in society. And he said, quote, Nothing must interfere with the fulfillment of our manifest destiny to overspread the continent allotted by providence for the free development of our yearly multiplying millions. 
destiny, I think we all understand what a destiny is. Destiny is your fate, something that you must do, that the will of the gods, the motion of the universe, the tides of history are moving in an inexorable direction. That things are moving in one way can't be avoided. The word, that's destiny. We all know what that is. If something is manifest, a definition of manifest means it's, it's obvious, readily apparent, clear for anyone who wishes to look. And Americans in the 1840s started to believe that it should be obvious that Americans were graced by God to spread across the North American continent to the Pacific Ocean. And with that cultural change, there was no official government policy. No, the government didn't say, hey, sign up and go west. It was organic. People started feeling that this was something possible. This was opportunity for people. This was something that you could do. And first with a trickle, and then in an absolute flood, people sold, sold their belongings, sold their houses, picked themselves up, and made the very difficult journey across a continent to the Pacific Coast. And this flood lasts through the Civil War till about 1870. Nearly half a million people traveled by wagon train first to the rich farmland of Oregon, and then to California, and then in what, uh, into what is today Washington State. Half a million people. It's a lot of people just to get up and go. That's, you know, that's more people, you know, that, that came to the colonies, almost, from, from Europe. The main route of this expansion... The main route of this expansion was known as the Oregon Trail. The west coast of Oregon was the first area on the Pacific coast to be, that was attractive to a large number of American settlers. In the year 1840, there's only about 500 Americans living there. And if you remember back from block, I believe it was uh, five, that you had um, the Convention of 1818, which took that land of Oregon, let's fire it up on the computer here, territory there on the Pacific coast you see that that large territory in the yellow was ruled jointly it was ruled uh, jointly by the United States and Great Britain there's only about 500 Americans living there a few hundred Englishmen mostly Native Americans uh, but it was ruled jointly uh, as far as it was ruled at all by a joint commission of Americans and British However, so there's the territory, and you can see the red line, that is the Oregon Trail coming into uh, the, the, the territory of Oregon. Uh, Oregon fever gripped the country. Starting in 1843, thousands of pioneers every year travel uh, the Oregon Trail. And it started, like I said, it was not official government policy. Every town, pretty much, in the United States started developing these cooperative associations that we talked about in the last block. People that got together uh, to disseminate information, to provide help, uh, to set up groups to go together, to move to Oregon, travel together, take, you know, half your town almost, pick up and go. Oregon is attractive because as soon as people realize that the Willamette Valley especially, the Willamette River and its valley is some of the best farmland in America uh, to this day, that gave people a practical reason to go, why are you going to Oregon? Well, it's great farmland. But it was a lot more than that. That it was this cultural feeling that Americans were doing something wonderful that Americans were doing something worthwhile, that Americans were doing something that 10th grade students would one day learn about in a history class. 
and this spirit of the age to settle this vast and wild continent filled with buffalo and Indians and desperados and Mexicans and British. I mean, the idea that civilization was going to cross a continent inspired people to believe that they were part of something greater. So who went? Who undertook this difficult journey? For the most part, it was working in middle-class people. Poor people couldn't go, they couldn't afford it. The trip, you know, between buying oxen and a wagon and supplies, cost about $600, uh, which was not cheap in those days. Uh, you would have to, you know, either sell your house if you owned one, or sell your farm, or save your money, you know, very carefully for a little while to be able to afford to go. Uh, but, like we said, half a million people went. Most trips started off at jump-off points. The most famous was Independence, Missouri, right along the Mississippi River. That was um, where most of these wagon trains started off. St. Louis, the nearest large city, became known as the Gateway to the West. And that's why... There you go. Let's have a look. The Gateway to the West... That's why St. Louis has the very famous Gateway Arch, because St. Louis was the gateway to the West. Uh, not technically St. Louis, the little town of Independence, which was near St. Louis, but St. Louis becomes known as the, um, the gateway uh, to the Western continent. Most people tr did not, you didn't travel alone. It wasn't like you and your family bought a wagon and just set out. Um, People left in wagon trains. Dozens of families, um, extended families would go, dozens of families would get together, kind of elect somebody leader, and they would push off 20, 30, 40 wagons uh, in a train. And that was done so people could uh, share things as needed. It was much easier to defend yourself in a group of 40 um, wagons as opposed to one wagon. Every night the wagons would kind of make a circle um, kind of make a little fort uh, to defend themselves against possible Indian attack. That Don't get the idea, don't get the idea that single wagons and single families just went off alone. Uh, that really did not happen. The trip was 2,000 miles. That's, that's a long way. Um, at a pretty severe pace, you can walk 20 miles in a day. That's a severe pace, 20 miles a day. You're not talking 20 miles a day. If you were good, you could do 15, 16, 17 miles a day, and that was a lot. Uh, so you're just talking, you know, 2,000 miles at a maximum 20 miles a day. You're talking months. This trip took months. Plains, rivers, mountains, forests, uh, deserts. You... It was not easy. It was not easy. And they were not, they, uh, the trips were taken in basically people's farm wagons. Um, or a special type of small wagon called a prairie schooner. Uh, they were built sturdily. They had wooden wheels with iron strips around the wheels. So the iron, you know, wouldn't damage itself bumping along. There are no roads. It's a trail. Um, it's not a paved road. Um, it could hold up about hold up to about two tons of cargo, four thousand pounds. But everything that was in that wagon is something you needed to start your life in Oregon. It wasn't like you got to Oregon and there was you know a big government center buy everything you need here. No, you had to carry it on your wagon, and these wagon uh, for the most part were pulled by oxen. Oxen uh, oxen was the first choice. The second choice were mules. Um, oxen are big, strong, powerful animals. Uh, usually four to six oxen pull uh, a wagon. And of course, throughout the course of the trip, you have to make sure that those oxen are healthy, those oxen have enough to eat, those oxen have enough to drink, or you're going to end up with really skinny oxen. And after really skinny oxen, the next thing that happens is dead oxen. You have dead oxen, you're done. There's no way your wagon can be pulled. The smallest children would ride in the wagons. If you were less than five, or if you were heavily pregnant, 
you could ride. Otherwise, you walked. Beside the wagon, out front, with a gun, talking to people, just one foot in front of the other, left, right, left foot, left, right, left, right, all day long. In the dust, you know, when it was dry, it's a tr dirt trail, the wagons just kick up dust, it starts to cake in your eyes and your mouth and in your ears, and then when it rains, that gets rid of the dust, but it turns the trail into mud, um, which is obviously much, makes the oxen have to work that much harder to pull this 4,000 pound wagon. Uh, and if you look at your notes, um, there's kind of a picture of the wagon there. It's worth taking a little bit of a look at. Um, it has that covered top, you know, that kind of splays out like this to keep everything in the wagon protected from the rain. Uh, it has a, you know, a little wooden brake, and it's it's nothing complicated, really. Um, someone would sit up on the jockey box and direct the oxen. And there they sat behind this team of oxen, that must have been a pleasant experience, uh, for 2,000 miles. If it wasn't hot enough, or cold enough, or long enough, there was plenty of other difficulties and dangers uh, for people to deal with. Food. You brought food in the wagon, usually about 150 pounds of food for every adult. Um, biscuits, dried meats, beans, uh, stuff, you know, that obviously no fresh fruit, no vegetables, you know, it would spoil. Um, bacon, salted pork, uh, hard bread, uh, about 150 pounds per person. And the diet was very, you know, monotonous. Um, you would hunt uh, to augment your diet with a little bit of meat. Um, buffalo, we're going to talk about the buffalo in a minute. Um, but, you know, uh, elk and gazelle and deer and bear and, you know, little critters and birds. For the first half of the trip, the food was not difficult to find. It's when, it's when, when you got up into the mountains uh, that the food became a little more difficult uh, to come by. And, you know, if food starts to run low, you start to ration. Now you're walking 15, 18 miles a day on half rations. Uh, and you're now you're worrying about hunting. We have to hunt food, or you know, you're walking 15 miles a day. You're not getting the calories you need. You're not getting any fresh fruit or fresh vegetables. You can very easily fall ill. Uh, and then, unless you are deathly ill, you're still not riding. You know, a lot of us don't even like to come to school with a little bit of the sniffles. How'd you like to walk 18 miles a day in the dust? You know, with with dysentery or cholera, uh, or just just a cold. Uh, not necessarily fun. I want to take a moment out from the notes to talk about the buffalo. The herds... The buffalo is the great American land animal. Let's see if I can get a good picture. The number of buffalo, as it was described by the people who were there, simply staggers the imagination. Unfortunately, there's no pictures. We, we, hopefully, we all hopefully know, you know what an American... First of all, it's not really a buffalo. This is an American bison. Here he is. Let's have a good look at this gigantic cow-like creature. There he is, the American buffalo. The American bison. Uh, incorrectly called a buffalo. In the 1840s, when this movement west began, there were buffalo numbering in the millions. Herds of four million buffalo roamed the Great Plains. And as westward expansion happened, and as mostly when the railroads went across, the buffalo were slaughtered. Now, most of the slaughter took place after the Oregon Trail, during the, in the age of the railroads. Those are buffalo skulls. Stacked up, it's got to be, what, 30, 40 feet high? Four, four, five stories high? But the number of buffalo that the settlers and the pioneers encountered on their trip west must simply have been awe-inspiring. 
Um, and the Indians, you know, as we're going to learn later in the year, the Indians de uh, depended on the buffalo for, um, you know, pretty much, you know, everything in their, in their cultural lifestyle. But these, her, I, I wish I could have seen it. Um, the herds of buffalo that, you know, stretched across the American plain must have been one of the glories of the natural world to see. Um, back to the notes. Uh, letter B, 4B. Uh, we talked about this briefly. If, if one of the oxen was injured or sick or died, there's nothing to pull the wagon. What you also had to worry was about the trip taking too long. If you did not cover enough ground every day, you might find yourselves, you might find yourself, um, in the mountains when winter struck. And if you were in the mountains when winter struck, you were in big trouble. Big trouble. It's a good time to tell the story of the Donner Party. This is one of those great, gross, freaky American stories. The Donner Party was a party of pioneers um, heading to California. It was a wagon train of about, it was a large wagon train. The head of the party, I believe, I believe his name was George, George Donner, decided that they were running a little bit late, that winter was coming in the Sierra uh, Nevadas, I believe. Yeah, I think it was the Sierra Nevadas. Uh, the Sierra Nevadas in California. And they had to get out of the mountains before winter struck because the snowstorms in the mountains would make passing uh, impossible. George Donner said, I know a shortcut. And about five or six of the wagons decided to take Donner's shortcut. Him, his family, uh, his extended family, his cousins, it was the Donner family and some, you know, few other people, but mostly his family. And he took them on this shortcut that turned out to be a catastrophe. They got stuck in the snow. A s early snowstorm came up and before they knew it, there was six feet of snow on the ground, and the wagons couldn't move, and the oxen were freezing, and then more storms blew through. They ended up building a camp in the mountains, and there was about 30 feet of snow that they were up on the level of the branches of the trees, and they had to try to survive through the winter. And food started to run low. So they killed the oxen and ate the oxen. But it was still only about November. And then they killed the mules. They ate the mules. And then they killed the horses and they ate the horses. And their ration of bread was down to a cup of bread every day. And then they killed their dogs. They ate their dogs. And people started getting sick. And people started dying. They buried them out in the snow. And when there was no food left, they ate the corpses of their own family. About half the party died. Half the half that survived, survived by eating uh, the dead corpses of the people who had died. It is the most famous example of American cannibalism in history. Finally, when the snowstorm stopped around March, several of the most of the strongest people put on uh, made snowshoes and tried to find a way uh, out for help. And finally, uh, they did. The Donner Party, what was left of it, uh, was rescued. And, of course, as soon as the national press heard about what had happened, it became a massive story. Everyone wanted to know what had happened. People were grossed out and disgusted, much like you probably are right now. Uh, but the Donner Party is just the most famous example of what would happen if you got, uh, if you went too slow and if you got stuck. People were afraid, moving on, uh, people were afraid of Indian attack. Uh, Indian attacks were not common, uh, but they did happen, especially if people were not careful, especially if people were not vigilant. We said uh, earlier that you would kind of put the wagons into a berm, into a circle, uh, for easy defense, and people every night would be required to stay up and keep watch. 
and that duty kind of rotated um, throughout the members of the party. The biggest killer on the trail was disease. Um, between 2% and 5% of people died of disease every trip. And that's, 2% doesn't sound like a lot, but 2% is one person in 50, and 5% is one person in 20. Uh, so if you leave with a party of 20 people, you know, just think of your extended family, aunts, uncles, cousins, the numbers said that at least one of those people would not be alive by the time you reached Oregon. Um, Towards the end, right in Oregon, before a road was built, you had to float your wagon down the rapids of the Columbia River. And can you just imagine being that close to being there? And you're on this, you know, you've caulked your wagon, and you're floating it down the river, and you have this giant pole that you're trying to, you know, push the wagon one way or push the wagon the other way uh, so it doesn't hit the rocks. And if that thing hits the rocks with all your stuff in it, and then it's, it's in the river and ruined and people are drowning that close to the end, must have really sucked. In all, anywhere from about 3% to 10% of people who left did not make it. Um, those are, if, if there was a 3 to 10% chance that you would die in a car accident this year, you probably wouldn't be driving very much. Um, but the fever was such that people went, and they went by the thousands. The Oregon Trail was not the only trail. Um, that took people west. There was the California Trail, which took the Oregon uh, Trail halfway and then cut off south uh, towards the Gold Rush area of California. The Santa Fe Trail uh, led from Missouri to the city of Santa Fe. Uh, the old Spanish Trail you could pick up then from the city of Santa Fe, uh, or the, the, the town of Santa Fe, to the little, a little tiny village uh, in Southern California called Los Angeles. Uh, Los Angeles could not possibly grow into a large city because there was no water. Uh, in Los Angeles. It doesn't rain in Los Angeles more than a few times a year, so you can't farm in Los Angeles uh, in the 19th century. Uh, so Los Angeles was a very small town. Uh, there was the Butterfield Overland Mail Route, or the Oxbow Route, which led uh, from Missouri through Texas to San Diego, which was the southernmost American city in California. Uh, the Mormon Trail took the Mormons to Utah, and we talked about the Mormons last block. Um, if you were a little wealthier and interested in moving out west, you could pay a little bit more money and take a ship all the way around the coast of South America. There's no Panama Canal yet. Uh, so if you're going by ship, you would leave New York or you would leave New Orleans or Philadelphia, sail all the way down the South African coast, around Tierra del Fuego and the Straits of Magellan, and then all the way back up. Um, and that obviously had dangers of its own but you didn't have to walk for 2,000 miles. Thousands of settlers, though, arrived. Dozens more every day. They claimed land, which they had bought back east. Uh, the United States government was very, very good at organizing land sales. Uh, they were very efficient at it. Uh, you could buy a piece of land for very little money down. You bought it out west. You went out to Oregon. You found the government representative there. He showed you the land that you had bought, and then the next day you got to work. You had to build a house, you had to plant a crop, you had to start a town. That the diary of a woman um, on the trip pretty much said it was like October 27th. Hallelujah. Reached Oregon. Amazing. Stunning. Beautiful. October 28th. Got to work. And these were hardworking people. They were as hardworking as their pilgrim forefathers and the people who had cleared out Pennsylvania and Ohio and Indiana. And their monument, uh, their monument are the states of California, Oregon, and Washington. Um, that the, especially Washington and Oregon, um, and the white population of California, most of them trace their lineage right back uh, to these, these pioneers uh, who answered the call um, who joined in this movement to go west uh, and seek their fortune. Um, and it became a major part of, of who we are as a culture.